Hello, souls and demons, and welcome back to the show. Today I have episode 5 of I Found My Likeness in a Torture Game, written by Cecily1987. And if you're enjoying the series so far, don't forget to follow and give a like or a comment depending on where you're listening. And with that, let's sit back, grip our seats, and enjoy the show. My hands were bound tightly behind my back. I felt multiple hands pick me up and begin to carry me. I tried to scream, but something was wrapped tightly around the hood that had covered my face, muffling my cries. The distinct ripping sound it made told me it was duct tape they were using. This made breathing an intense labor through my nose and through the cloth. In the darkness, all I could do was listen and pray someone in the neighborhood heard the commotion and was calling for help. What about the kid? A gruff voice asked. Leave him. I don't kill non-combatants. I'm not a sicko like he is, answered another. I heard the van doors open and I was tossed in unceremoniously to land on my face and stomach. Get rid of the car and dead body. Pick up your brass. You know the drill. Meet at location Bravo. Came yet another voice. I was terrified yet relieved when I heard the van doors close. At least Daniel was being left behind. And hopefully he would be okay if he made it to the hospital. Take that shit off her head before she suffocates, somebody said. I felt the sharp prick of a needle in my shoulder and quickly fell into unconsciousness. When I woke back up, I immediately noticed a few changes in my predicament. First off, I still had the blinding hood over my head, but I could breathe better and see a bit of light coming through the cloth. Secondly, I was stripped to my bra and underwear and was freezing, goosebumps running all down my body. Finally, I could feel I was restrained to an even colder metal table. My feet were angled towards the ground and tied together tightly. My hands restrained high above my head and separated like I was making a wide gesture with my body. I felt helpless and embarrassed and scared. But most of all, I knew these were the feelings these sickos wanted me to feel. So I felt anger. A burning hot anger that made me tremble more than the cold and the fear. The money should be in your team's accounts within the next three to five business days. Tell your guys I threw in a little bonus for the truly outstanding work, said an excited croaky voice. Also, I know the cleanup was more than expected, and I adjusted the price for the body disposal. That's great, boss, replied a louder, more authoritative voice. It reminded me of one of the men I heard out on the road when I was first snatched up. SUV is gone. Driver's body is gone. House swept clean of evidence, the deep voice continued. Her computer was fried, with her clueless babysitter being none the wiser. Any trace of you should be wiped clean. Awesome. Awesome. The croaky voice snickered back, barely holding back his excitement. I knew you guys were worth the high price tag. And the bonus is just a thank you for helping me achieve my dream. At long last. Well, boss man, retorted the deep voice. There was a pause of consideration. You can keep my bonus. And take off a couple thousand if you let me have a go with Miss Hollywood over there. I used to watch her bootleg DVD on repeat when I was deployed. Absolutely not. She is mine. No one touches her but me. The croaky voiced man snapped back immediately. The nerd rage came through like boiling venom. Okay, okay, I was just trying to save you some money. She's all yours, just as ordered the other man said back. Me and my men will take our leave and leave you two to your fun. 
I heard a heavy set of boots walk away, echoing off of hard floors and high ceilings. I was left alone in silence, with only the excited breathing of the anxious man slowly getting closer to me. I tried to maintain a limp posture, not wanting to give away that I was awake under the hood. But it was hard as the tension grew unbearable between us. I could feel the creepy man's presence standing over me, staring at me. I could hear his ragged breathing and hard swallowing. I could smell a cologne coming off of him. It was something familiar. Was it Bond number 9? That was my favorite when my ex-husband would wear it. I doubt this was a coincidence. I felt the finger touch my exposed midriff, right below the belly button and all pretense was over. My entire body tensed up, like I had been touched with an electric wire, and I let out a gasp of disgust. Oh, so you are awake, said the amused, croaky voice. Good, we can begin now. The man ripped the hood off my head. The sudden flood of light made me close my eyes, and for a second, I considered keeping them closed in case he decided to let me go, since I hadn't seen his face yet. This man was obviously an accomplice of Mel's that I didn't know. But I knew that train of thought was stupid. They had obsessed over all of this and committed murder to get to me. They were not going to let me go. And if I was going to die, I would die looking them in the eyes. As brave as I tried to be, it still didn't stop the hot tears from racing down my face as I opened my eyes to look at my captor. He was a tall, pale man with sunken features and big green eyes. His hair was a curly white dude fro that looked like a dyed and unnatural jet black. He wore a crooked smile, along with a $500 purple silk shirt, slacks, and Rolex on display. To my horror, I also realized the room I was in was a one-to-one -one replica of the kill room in the video game. Black tarped up walls, white tile floor, and overhead poseable light. The scrawny man clicked his tongue and leaned in to wipe a tear away from my eye. No tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. We have such sights to show you, he said with the biggest self-congratulatory grin on his face. You're quoting freaking Hellraiser to me? I screamed at him, my temper flaring up again. Are you serious? Are you freaking serious? I screamed at his dumb face. His cocky smile disappeared, replaced with surprise and embarrassment. You really are nothing but a nerd-ass loser, aren't you? I spit the words out at him. Speaking of spit, I physically tried to spit on him, but couldn't get enough saliva to launch the three feet to hit him. So I just ended up drooling on myself. Your creepy ass has got to hire actual tough guy mercenaries to kidnap me. Because you are too much of a sissy boy to do it yourself. You know I would kick your goofy looking ass. I continued my tirade. If I was going to die, he was going to get a piece of my mind. Then you dress up all smooth, like you're Christian Grey or something. You're pathetic to me. Disgusting and a sad excuse for. The breath was knocked out of my lungs when my kidnapper punched me full force in the stomach. My hands instinctively pulled against their restraints as I tried to curl in on myself. His narrow face scrunched up in anger and he let out a small cry of exertion as he hit me again in the ribs. The thud of his fist slamming into me will stay with me forever. My vision blurred around the edges as oxygen refused to enter my lungs. No matter how hard I tried inhaling, panic gripped me as I thought I would suffocate and die. 
until finally, blessed air returned to my lungs, and I saw the cruel, satisfied smirk and an evil glint in his green eyes. You will learn to show me respect, little pet. He hit me one more time, right in the solar plex, causing me to moan in agony. We have plenty of time for you to learn, he said. I have waited a long time for this. For the next hour, he softened me up. I don't really want to go into explicit detail, but I'll skim over his initial interactions with me. He used a small remote in his pants pocket to lower the temperature in the dark room to the low 40s. He readjusted the overhead light to shine it blindingly into my eyes and he was quick to punch me in the midsection every time I tried to speak up. And he monologued. Oh God, did he monologue. He told me how much he had watched me from afar, how he wanted to get closer to me for years. So he wanted his dark torture game to satiate his desires. But he knew that would never be enough. He knew he would eventually have to have the real thing. He would have to have me. And now he had the money and influence to make it possible. It all seemed practiced and rehearsed. Like a first year theater student giving a solo performance after seeing Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. There were a lot of, you see, and what if I told you, and in other words, as he droned on and on. His speech was also filled with dramatic hand flourishes as he spun a dagger playfully around in whimsical circles. He spouted edgy tropes like, My dark passenger wanted more, and The beast inside me could not be kept bound for long. I wanted to vomit. Maybe I could hit him with the stuff at least. Finally, he stopped. Hands out to the side, dagger in hand, head down like he was taking a bow. The idiot was really leaning into the unhinged villain shtick. My hands were getting numb, and I was shivering as I looked up at his grinning face. You have my permission to speak, my pet, he snickered. You can ask any question you like. But be mindful of your tone. I hung there for a while silently, gathering my thoughts and quelling my anger before I opened my mouth to ask, Where is Mel? The sly grin on the man's pale face spread into a full-on toothy smile. An evil gleam appeared in his eye, and he held up a bony finger to either give me a shh or a one-moment gesture. He turned quickly and pushed back one of the hanging tarps that stood as one of the kill room's walls and quickly disappeared through it. I heard my captor's footsteps retreat down a long hallway. There was the sound of metal chains and something like a heavy garage door being slid open. I heard the footsteps coming back towards me but this time accompanied with a squeaky grinding sound. I realized I was being a fool, wasting my time listening for the crazy man's imminent return. This was my first time alone, my only window to escape, so I began pulling at my restraints. I feel like I could free my legs easily if my hands were undone, but they were both held tight spread out above me on metal rods. It was hard to wiggle around as I realized my waist was buckled to the cold table that held me propped upright, and the blinding light in my eyes made it hard for me to see anything around me. I was too late. I ran out of time as the tarp wall was pushed back and my captor came backing in, pulling something heavy with him. He grunted as he wheeled whatever it was around for me to see. I squinted through the blinding light above my head, trying to make out the massive frame of something. 
My captor saw this and quickly darted over to redirect the lamp out of my eyes. He was clearly eager to show me what he had brought me. I gasped in horror. It was Mel. He was bloodied and beaten and naked, slumped over in some sort of makeshift wheelchair. His arms had bloody cords tying them to the armrests, with giant nails through both of his hands, nailing them down. He had a hundred cuts all over his heavily tattooed body, with two swollen eyes. His feet dangled limp on the ground, with blood dripping from somewhere off of them. I didn't understand. My mind cracked. I screamed at the sight in utter confusion and terror. My pencil-framed captor responded back with his own devious laughter, a laughter deep from his belly. Truly, this was the reaction he wanted from me all along. Why? Why did you kill him? I screamed. The pale man jumped over to me, with amazing quickness to grab me under my chin, to yank it up roughly to face him. His stinking breath hit me, as he hissed at me through gritted teeth, his face only an inch away from mine. I share you with no one. The creep spun around and darted back to Mel. With a flash, the knife was back in his hand, and he jammed it into Mel's left shoulder, causing the sickening sound of metal thudding into meat. Mel sprung to life and screamed so loud my ears popped. His eyes bulged and he pulled futilely at his restraints. Mel shook the makeshift chair and kicked his bloody feet to smear the white tiles underneath. That's quite enough, Mel, my boy. The pale-faced captor spoke in his cracked voice. He reached into his pocket and produced a syringe to stick in Mel's thick neck. Mel's scream instantly tapered off and his eyes rolled into the back of his head. I didn't know what was going on, but I was glad of the small mercy of Mel losing consciousness and escaping the pain temporarily. But my stomach twisted in knots at the thought of this man doing the same to me. Your Mel was never part of this, my captor laughed. I just needed a red herring, someone close to you that was easily manipulated, someone with past trauma and a history of violence, the creeper said, running his finger along Mel's tribal tattoo playfully. But, but, I started saying with trepidation, wary of an incoming blow. He shot Tony and ran. I realized no blows were coming from my captor. I guess he wanted me to ask questions. He had been acting so weird that day. How was he not part of all of this? I know, right? My captor said with force and credulity, holding his arms out wide as if in non-belief. I couldn't have planned for better results. What do you mean? He wasn't working with you? Well, yes and no smiled my captor. Mel was being used, yes. But when Big Mel shot your other knuckle-dragger employee, that was extracurricular activity on his part. I see you don't fully understand, the creep almost shouted at me, as he sprang forward again to place the tip of the knife under my chin. I squeaked in fright and tried my hardest to recoil from the cold blade and his wild-eyed stare. For an ex-Special Forces guy, Mel, Kilo, Kahananui, didn't have great home security. My own spec op guys had no problem breaking in and replacing his mood stabilizers with sugar pills. After a month of this, I added some other things, then just sugar into his pills. Mostly I had them add mild hallucinogens, amphetamines, and all sorts of bad stuff that don't react well together. I named the mixture I created, The Nasties. 
your damn protector was poisoning himself and making himself crazy by taking the medicine he thought was supposed to help keep him sane, the creeper said, actually holding his sides as he began laughing. The dose of the nasties he took on the day he shot the other bodyguard was the highest dose he had ever taken. My team found him in the nearby park, about to call the cops and turn himself in. Can you believe that? He would have ruined all the fun that very moment. But no. My captor turned to give a loving smile to the unconscious and bleeding man. My team intercepted him before he grew a conscience. And I got myself a little practice buddy to sharpen up my skills before I met you. <sighs> Who are you? I asked weakly only now beginning to realize how outmatched I really was all this time. Oh, Miss J, you probably suspected me from the very beginning. Occam's razor and all that jazz, he said, as he got back into my face to breathe his nasty breath on me. I started the game, mapped the boundaries, created the rules, activated the players, and turned a single-player game into a PvP multiplayer arena. I've been with you the whole time, like a dungeon master setting up encounters for you to face. He stopped and held his breath comically, like this was some sort of stand-up routine he was performing. I realized I was supposed to be guessing who he was. Truth was, I didn't care at this point. All of my interest in who he was was sucked out of me as I stared at his ugly face as he desperately tried to be funny or edgy. The man that was going to torture and kill me was trying to be funny. I didn't care who he was anymore. He was a sick freak. He had always been a sick freak. Just a sad loser, I said in a monotone voice straight to him. I knew I would pay for my disrespect to his fragile ego, but maybe he would kill me on accident, and I could forgo all the hours or days of torture he had planned. His cheerful demeanor was extinguished, and he let out the air he was holding in his lungs in an angry huff. He screamed in my face, spittle moistening my skin. It was me all along. Herald of the Void, you dumb bitch. It was me. I was playing you from day one. He came around with a slap so hard that I literally saw stars and tasted blood in my mouth. I started your nightmare, and I will be here long, long after, when I finally have had enough of you. Another slap landed. You will curse the day. You ever decided to become an actress, because that was the day you doomed yourself to fall into my notice and into my hands. Another strike to my stomach. Something heavy. A knee, maybe? I'll make sure to keep you for as long as possible. Kinda like your gorilla friend over there. I'll cut off the pieces I don't like. He grabbed me by my throat and began to squeeze. I'll cut out that sassy tongue first. Maybe cut off your hands and feet so I can store you in boxes and take you with me places. Maybe I'll send the pieces I don't want back to your son. A new body pot for each new birthday. I'll have to think of something special for his 18th birthday. My son. His 18th birthday. His whole life without me. This caused a wave of nauseating panic within me. My captor, Herald of the Void, let go of my neck just long enough for me to vomit into his smug face. I would have felt some satisfaction in this if I didn't immediately start to hyperventilate and pass out soon after. It was terrible. I thought I was dying. 
But the truth was, my ordeal was far from over. I would wake up to Harold, setting up more of his torture games for me. Little did I know at that time that I was entering the final stretch of my terrible adventure. The Terrible and Bloody Finale